Welcome back, folks, to another special episode. I am your host, Liz Soria, with the Tax Advisor and Business Coach Success Podcast. Today, I have an incredible expert joining me, and we're going to be discussing about, uh, goodness, that's, what is it? <laughs> How to save more than 90% of your income. I have Daniel Amaduri, and uh, Daniel, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on your show. It is my pleasure. It truly is. And thanks for taking the time. Um, we, let me go ahead and just do a brief introduction of who you are that way the audience know. And uh, Mr. Okay. Daniel Amaduri is a co-founder of the Future Money Trends. It's a free newsletter, and you heard that right, it is a free newsletter that focuses on personal finance for the new companies, okay? Each week he shares well-digest and new investment ideas when it comes to microeconomics, okay? He's a real trend forecaster. Well, Daniel, what can I tell you? Like I say, I already subscribed to your newsletter, and uh, so far, so good. And uh, I'm amazed that you're still doing this as a free service. So um, I'd like to get started with kind of a few questions, if that's okay with you, Daniel? Sure. Perfect. Okay. So one of the things I wanted to ask you was, and I think this is a very common question as we go into podcasts and, and videos, people always have amazing you know, curiosity to understand how did you get started, right? Because we all have one day, one year of our life that we decide, well, I need to do something different. I need to move forward. So how and when did you get started in your business? Uh, specifically, the Future Money Trends letter in the publishing business, we started in 2010. Oh. Uh, it actually goes back to 2008, though. I was doing videos on YouTube as a hobby. Is and that right? writing on blogs as a hobby. And then it migrated into a full-blown publishing business. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Wow. Are you still doing, you have your channel on YouTube also, right? Do you? Yeah, we actually have five YouTube channels now, and uh, it's about probably 100,000 subscribers. Congratulations. That's, that's a lot because I'm only doing a few hundreds, but <laughs> I'm getting there somewhere, somehow, right? So that's fantastic. Okay. Uh, now, what are some of the challenges that you kind of face, especially in early stage, you know, of, because I mean, there's plenty of newsletters out there, and I'm sure you have, like anybody else, competition. How in, did you find a way, or we call it a, a, a magic, uh, you know, uh, section where you were able to connect and people coming and subscribing to you? How were you able to, to create that exposure that people knew about your newsletter? Because that's, that's important, isn't it? You know, it is very important. Um, you know, I built all of the business through YouTube. So it's doing videos. If you go oh, to the wow. Vision Victory channel or Future Money Trends, all of it was built from YouTube and introducing the channel that way. Uh, I got lucky that in, you know, in 08, YouTube was just starting out. It was less than probably two years old. Hadn't even been taken over by Google yet. Wow. So there was a little bit of that first mover advantage where, you know, I was talking on uh, about the economy when, there really wasn't economic channels. Now there's thousands of them. So I think it was just me and another guy talking about the economy. Otherwise it was a, you know, cats on ceiling fans. So really that focus on YouTube and then with the free newsletter and immediately going to an ad based uh, revenue model, it freed me up. I didn't have to worry about money. I didn't have to worry about trying to sell people anything. I was able just to expose myself and expose my own journey and become financially in becoming financially independent and different investments that I was learning about. So it's a selfish letter in the way that I love reading six to eight hours a day, looking for new ways to make money. And of course, as soon as I figure out a new way to make money or a safe way to make money or something that the rich are doing that may, we may not have learned as someone coming up in the middle class, I'm able to quickly pass that on to my readers. And you know, I often experiment on some of these uh, investments that pay dividends or, or yields you know, for a year before I'll share them just to make sure they are what they are advertising, especially with this new fintech. Uh, revolution where there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer lending but everything I get to learn I get to share and that's the fun part and I think that's the real connection between my subscribers and myself and I must agree and you know what I think it's amazing that um, and interesting at the same point that you know you're starting YouTube because I started way back I think it was like 2010 um, but I didn't take it seriously I, I really did and I, I, I thought well video it, to me is something kind of even personal 
And even though I, I've been told that I do have, you know, great social skills, uh, uh, however, I think it was, it was something finding myself that, you know, you can have strangers out there, hundreds of them just watching you and you don't know them. <laughs> you just don't know them at all. Uh, so yeah. th I think a lot of people feel uh, sort of like an intimidation uh, to go in front of a camera and record um, or even do a podcast like I started just about a year ago. My question to you is, uh, newsletter, like I said, there's a lot of steel competition. How do you keep up? I mean, because I'm sure others are trying to take over your, 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 your you know, your niche and, and also your, 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 your customers. Um, anything that you've done differently, and I would say in the last, let's say, two, three years, uh, where you see more competition? Uh, there's tons of competition in the newsletter industry, especially the financial space. My belief has always been, though, there's so much pie because the financial space is like you've got you've got uh, sex, you've got diets, and you've got money. Those are three things. <laughs> it's so that true. It's an endless. Great. You point them out. An endless stream. It'll never end. It'll never stop. And there's always new people wanting to learn about those three topics. So yeah, I think I've never really focused on the competitors. Uh, and uh, uh, it, with that, with the exception of trying to mimic things that I see that are successful as I was learning and building the business. But the only thing that I've done that I've really focused on is just brutal honesty. I've said some tough things about as far as how I've saved money and my wife saved money. I've been very honest about, you know, you know, when, you know, what, what it, what it means to me when you buy a stock, you know, a lot of people think you can get rich from stocks. I'm, I'm not one of them. I think the odds are low. Uh, you know, but so there's a lot of gimmicks out there because someone's trying to sell a certain trading program or technical analysis but the fact is is i've never met a, a rich person who's just day traded stocks and i i've met thousands of traders over the years and i've never met a, day, a rich day trader uh, i've met a lot of rich day traders who sell day trading programs so oh. i just try to be honest with my subscribers that look here's what i've done i've been interested in this stuff since i was a little boy uh, i read rich dad poor dad or actually his book before he before he wrote yeah. rich dad poor dad I read another book that he wrote, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, uh, when I was 13 years old. I've been eating this stuff up for a long time. That is a long time, <laughs> Daniel. Um, and, and how many subscribers do you have right now, currently? So with the Future Money Trends letter, there's about 75,000 subscribers, but we have five other letters, and it's about over 250,000 subscribers right now. That is incredible. That is truly incredible. Wow. And with the money trend, it, 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 how long has it been again? And, and, and how, what, when did you see there was a peak on, on subscribers? Anything specifically, a certain time of trend or anything that you did to kind of push the newsletter out? Because again, I, I love, and, and the reason why I'm emphasizing a lot on the newsletter is because a lot of people say that the newsletters are dead. The history. That used to be like the big thing to do, um, you know, to um, always stay in contact with, you know, your, 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 your potential, you know, customers or even your current ones. Um, from your standpoint, I mean, what do you feel? Is newsletters still something effective, something is good for marketing, collecting those emails? Because that's to say that emails you should collect, collect, collect. But how effective does the new letter, newsletter has to be? Um, for it to, for the, another one, the subscribers not to get disappointed with it, right? Sure. Well, I mean, don't, don't over promise things you can't deliver on. Make sure the expectations, make sure people are subscribing, uh, whatever they're subscribing for, make sure that that's what they get. Uh, oftentimes you might subscribe to a newsletter thinking you're going to get some information about news, but all, all of a sudden you notice your inbox is flooded with advertisements twice a day. <laughs> no, that's horrible. Yeah. And that's yes. rampant across the newsletter industry. So I would just say, make sure, you know, it's, um, you know, you're always doing things to add value to the people subscribing. If you're going to have an advertisement, you know, have an advertisement every fourth or fifth email, but make sure the vast majority of the emails and the content they're receiving are things that you're passionate about and things that they want to hear. And that's what can create a strong newsletter. But what was your, 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 your peak? In other words, where did you feel that after publishing, let's say after one year, two years, what, what was that time frame that you felt like you were comfortable and finally you start seeing results? You know, that's interesting. So um, we spent six months just focusing on building oh, the newsletter. I'm sorry. 
my light is just off on the background, so I apologize. Go ahead. No worries. We spent about six months just building the the newsletter with with three emails a week, three articles a week out on the internet, one video every Friday. We did that for about six to seven months before we put up our first advertisement. So we didn't want to begin generating revenues until we had built uh, up an audience and given people a reason to come to future money trends uh, specifically. So I would say as far as, uh, you know, uh, when did we notice that, you know, it, it was, it, things were working. I mean, essentially I went into this knowing that it could work because I was already making YouTube videos that were getting traction. So it was a matter of sending people somewhere that I could have a more personalized relationship with them. And, you know, people say email is dead, man. I check my emails all day long and I bet everybody listening to this does. So I don't know why they say emails are dead, especially when we have this little thing called a smartphone with a smartphone. <laughs> you, you can, you can check your emails even when you're not by a computer. So I think email is a very powerful tool for businesses. But, you know, look, it's like anything. It's like a plant. If you don't water it, it's going to die. So if you want to have a strong audience with your newsletter and people connecting and people responding to ads, you need to water that newsletter. You need to give them great content that they'll want before, you know, constantly. You can't just be the, it can't be an, an email that's constantly asking for something. You need to give, 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 and then ask. You have a great point. Those were really, really great points. And I think you're right. I mean, I, I know that I've been, you know, I'm actually, I recently have been canceling a lot of my subscriptions because I feel like I'm being invaded in my inbox, you know, and you're right. I mean, it's like at the beginning, they, they give you valuable information within a very short span of time. Okay. You said six months in your case, I'm talking about maybe just a few weeks and now you're getting not only are you getting all these ads on the newsletter, but somehow you're getting newsletters that you never subscribe to, or you're getting uh, emails from, you yeah. know, unsolicited, and, and, you know, that's terrible. I mean, you're selling my email address, and I'm not happy with that. So I think that that's something that a lot of people who have newsletters, they, they and hopefully if they are listening to this podcast or they're watching it, uh, to realize that, like you said, deliver what you promised from, from the beginning and, you know, give them the value that, 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 that that's the reason why they, they subscribe in the first time, right? That was the main reason. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Danny. And I was just gonna say, any business owner who's listening to this, make sure you do have a way to uh, collect emails and, and reach out to your, your customers or clients or database because, you know, I've seen people with YouTube channels, Google's ripped them down for no reason. I've seen people with great websites where they've lost all their Google advertising revenue because maybe they lean conservative or something in the last six months. So, you know, don't trust uh, Google and don't trust, you know, YouTube, or which is also owned by Google or Facebook, to, to hold your business contacts. Make sure you have a website and make sure you're collecting information from people so that you can respond directly to them. And, you know, you're not dependent on some Silicon Valley company that, you know, maybe, maybe they don't like your content and they'll, and they'll, you know, get rid of your account in the future. That is true. That is so true. And, and I didn't mean to go off track because I know uh, actually the topic of uh, the interview today is, is it's really how to save 90% of your income. But um, I think that for the listeners and audience, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to know, that you know coming from someone like you who's still active and utilizing a, a newsletter um to you know put out your message that it, it's still a great promotional uh method to use um as much as like i said it's been criticized right that email is kind of dead by by now so thank you for sharing that i know that was something extra so let's go ahead and move on with uh your secrets because i want to know your secrets and, and, and obviously everybody else who, who again is listening and watching this how do you save 90 percent of the income i mean when you have you know recurring expenses how do you do that please share that with us daniel well, my wife and I were able to save 90% of our income in 2012. We were very aggressive savers, obviously, but you know, I, there's, there's, there's not a magic bullet for everybody. We had to make some tough decisions. I would say the biggest way to reduce your expenses okay. is moving. 
Um, you know, really interesting. You know, Sharon, go deep, go deep. I'm gonna turn my live, my back no because I'm so sorry for those who are watching me. Much better. I just feel like the the light was going on and off a little bit in the background. All right. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no worries. So, being from Southern California, uh, there were there were many ways to save money. So, in 2012, we moved to the desert region of California, which isn't hard. It's about an hour and a half inland. But the home prices, uh, you know, were 75% off if you were in a coastal neighborhood, maybe even more. So the wow. biggest way we could save is, is leaving the area. Now, you might be able to, if you're listening to this show, you might be able to leave your area 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and drastically reduce your expenses. Now, in 2014, I actually took it to the next level and left the state and went to Texas. And then I lost uh, the income tax. So I literally saved a significant amount of money by losing that income tax and moving to an area in Texas, uh, the Austin area, where homes were much more affordable. I was able to get you know, a full acre with a guest house and a nice home uh, for my family with a pool for gosh, you know, one third of the cost that it would have uh, taken in, in California. So I moving is always gonna be your greatest saver. Um, and then, of course, you, you ha if you're married, you, you have to have a commitment to saving. I always tell people, try to automatically save uh, what you can. You know, if you're very serious, I mean, you, if you Google right now, you could find all sorts of ads from how to save money on credit cards or cutting your cable bill. But if you really want to cut and you want to cut to the bone, there are things out there like getting rid of, of uh, um, gym memberships or even stop eating, going out to eat. My wife and I, we literally cooked everything from home. We went to Mexican grocery stores. Uh, now in California, Is that right? you know, there was Peter Brothers and Albertsons and Vons and all the big ones. Sure. But I found out that the Mexican grocery stores, uh -huh. uh, Hispanic grocery stores, were were I was I asked I literally asked the vegetable guy I'm like why why is your why are your cucumbers 25 cents when I go to Vons and Stater Brothers they're a dollar and he said well look when Vons and Stater Brothers and and Albertsons and all these companies when they purchase their uh, produce when they leave all the produce that's left is where like a whole uh, not a Whole Foods but um, uh, a Winco like and a food is that what the discount buying? ones. Yeah, so they would come in. So there was there was another way to save money by not only eating at home, but shopping at a grocery store where you're getting the same cucumber. It just might have a nick on it or it might look different. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, really, the whole thing. But it was fine. The, the, so we would save money like that. Um, now, we did something very drastic. I mean, you know, we were really focused on building wealth, becoming financially independent. We had three dogs. We got rid of our three dogs. I know that sounds like, I mean, oh. I probably lost that. Right I'm a now. dog lover. What are you talking How about? Cruel. This is not good. <laughs> How I, cruel. I don't, um, I don't have three, so I have one. And you know, <laughs> what it is, that's my responsibility. So I am a, I am a pet lover, especially dogging. So, uh, okay, so you yeah. got three dogs. I can't believe you said this. Okay, go for it. You know, I mean, we shopped. I mean, think about the clothes you buy. I mean, you know, for guys, it's, it's kind of probably easy. You know, you can go to Ross, buy, buy some clothes, buy some slacks. And then, of course, you know, having your, your expenses down, your monthly expenses under control. And that comes into, like, your car. You know, I, I was always blown away when people would tell me their car payment was $600 a month. I had never had one over two or $300 a month. Today, I, I have a lease that's, you know, fairly high. But it's, it, it, it's in line with my lifestyle and my income. And, right. you know, I don't have any debt. So I own my, you know, I, we made it a point, you know, with my wife on a teacher's salary me with a starting business, we still paid off our house aggressively. We were very focused, you know? Wow. So I think it takes a lot of focus and it takes the, the courage and strength to say no to what the middle class's expectations are and peer pressure is because the middle class, if you think about it, especially in the United States, it isn't really a middle class. It's no. they finance their homes, they finance their cars, they finance their purchases with credit cards, they finance their college tuition. Everything's finance. That's a middle class built on it on air really and uh i, I one thing I want, I want to interrupt real quick and, and you're, you're, i can tell by by, by the, the speed of your brain the way you think it, it's the fact that you know we i think there's truly almost the medium class is almost gone in the united states um 
And I think back in the probably 60s, 70s, you saw that a lot. People were living very well and they were making a lot more money than now. Because when we took into the fact of inflation and interest and everything else, and just recently, um, you know, I'd like to share with you is that I just came across a phenomenal article. And you know, they were talking about, you know, if you look at inflation, they keep telling you it's 2%, it's about 3.5%, really. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you have all this rent going up and expenses. Like you said, food has extremely have been become very expensive. Um, and, you know, all this, everything is just an increase and people are not making it. So they're really doing it ends meet. That's really what's happening right now. So people are just borrowing money, borrowing money, and everything is plastic. Nobody believes in saving cash, saving money for the future. So in what really uh, I wanted to end the saying is that the fact that it was like ridiculous, it was like $8,600 per household that people have credit card debt, that's an average. That's stunning. I mean, we're back almost in the crisis that we started with the bubble in real estate back in, you know, in 2007. And here we are, you know, 11 years later, and now it's not about the housing issue. The problem right now is student loans and also the problem with the credit cards. People are borrowing more than we can there for. So it, it, it's an issue. It's becoming an issue. So definitely, number one, I want to do a, a real brief recap so far. Uh, housing, it obviously, is one of the major expenses that anyone's going to have. And by you deciding to pretty much leave your comfort zone, because that's what you did. You, that was an area, a state that you probably enjoy very much living in. Uh, you were used to probably having maybe, I don't know, relatives and, you know, friends around and deciding, hey, we need to do something. And sometimes we need to take drastic changes in our life. And it's hard. Some people are not adaptable. They're not flexible, right? But you were and your wife, and that's really an amazing story. So you step out of California and say, okay, we cannot afford to live in California. We're going somewhere else. And from that point on, everything just kind of got better for you, it sounds like. You Absolutely. Know? And I would take that to ne the next step further. When, even when you can't afford to live in California, if you can move, you should move because you can save money immediately from the income tax. And look, and again, I wasn't trying to get rich over 30, 40 years. If that's your plan, then that's then you're fine. But my plan was to expedite this and bang it out in 10 years. And it, we ended up doing it in five years. And when I say financially independent, I mean, paid off house, passive income covers the bills, you know, at that point in time, you're able to unleash all that creativity and everything you want to do in life, because really, what's the worst that can happen? I mean, even if my business blew up tomorrow, I've got a paid off house. I've got enough rentals and passive income that takes care of the bills. Okay. So I think financial independence frees you up in many ways. It does. It does. And, you know, it, it's amazing because I tell people really, and, and at least the clientele that I have, and most of them are doing well financially, but I tell you what, um, you know, from the prospects there, sometimes they call me, when you look at them, you know, from, from the financial standpoint, it's scary. <laughs> I mean, they, they're really not having sufficient cash flow. And uh, they just, like I said, they're living beyond means. And I think that going back to the, 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 the principle, the foundation of saying uh, we can live a modest life. And, but we need to make decisions. And like you said, the very first step, and I was going back to doing the recap, is number one, you move out of the state, okay? Um, you move somewhere else. I don't know. Were you familiar with Texas, by the way, uh, Daniel? I mean, no, I, I drove through it one time uh, just to see <laughs> if it was what it was like. It seemed like a nice place. I was kind of shocked, actually. It was very green. I didn't expect that. I thought it would be more deserty. <laughs> well, I've been in Texas twice, and that was a, a few years ago uh, over Houston and, and Dallas, and uh, actually uh, Corpus Christi, too. And I can tell you that I think it's a very lovely uh, state, by the way. Um, and I'm in Florida, for those of you who are wondering where I'm at, uh, or as we call it, the sunshine. I put a slash hurricane state, okay, because last year was a tough year for us, too. Um, so, again, uh, Florida was here. That's another state. It was wonderful. I, I mean, just a couple years ago, I mean, you could buy things at a very reasonable uh, price. And guess what? I really feel that we're in another bubble when it comes to real estate. Uh, prices are high again. 
and uh, people are having a hard time finding a home. There's really a shortage going on, especially in South Florida, where the, the demand is very high in the Tri-County. But going back, so we got the moving. Uh, you definitely cut back on uh, food, right? On um, Instead of doing, doing meals and oh, yeah. fancy restaurants, you cut that down. Um, and the third one, oops, sorry about that. That's just my reminder that we got a few more minutes before we wrap up. But anyhow, we can take a couple more minutes if it's okay with you, Daniel. And, and the third one was just to refresh my memory. You were talking about, uh, what was it? Oh, well, you, Go ahead. You, really getting getting in under control those monthly expenses like a car payment. I mean, really, if you're focused on building and, and, and having financial independence, you should have no car payment. So if that means you have to drive a $5,000, 10-year-old Nissan Altima, so be it. But Absolutely. you can't get rich built with a, a car payment, you know, in the four, five, six hundred dollars a month don't, range. Don't get stuck. So definitely cut down uh, or downsize, as we call it, right? Your 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 your, your housing. Um, cut down those of them meals, and if you can, at least do it once a month, you know. But don't do it every weekend because you're right; it, it does. Two people going out, it can cost you easily, you know, eighty, a hundred dollars. Uh, and then doing also car payment because that's another one, right? Um, other than that, any other things that you that you did to 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 try kind of you know squeeze every dollar that you could there you know to save even more? Well, outside of squeezing every dollar, I would say making sure that wherever you reallocate those dollars, put it in somewhere safe that you're not going to lose money. Um, you know, I think that's and and it was a strong focus on cash flow. My wife and I never speculated until you know we like to have fun like everybody else, buying a penny stock here and there, buying some stock, but. You know, you know, for the most part, we were focused like a laser on buying cash flow. And if you look at your investing as just acquiring and collecting more cash flow, you can't you can't go wrong. Nobody goes bankrupt from profits. No, I haven't heard anything anyone going bankrupt. You're right about that. And you know what's amazing? I think there's other other ways also saying, but those are the three main ones, and I have to agree with you on that. Uh, housing is one of the most expensive things that you can have as an expense. Uh, and again, going back to the beginning of you know the, the the series is that we were discussing about people living beyond the means, right? Uh, trying to uh, you know show off what they cannot really afford, you know. So sometimes it's and you know what I, I always say that you you just sleep a lot better at night <laughs> knowing that you have less debt and, and 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 you have less predators that they can knock on your door and harass you, you know, with their payments. And you know the fundamental here is that. You want to leave it, you know, in peace. I mean, what's better than that? The quality of life, right? So we all need money because that's the reality. I mean, uh, but it's how, and here's a good point. It's now sometimes how much you make is how much you save. And like I said, and then how you invest. What do you say? I think that's the three main points right here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and it comes down to a choice, really. You choose to be rich, you choose to save. You know, everybody, everybody is under the impression that we live in a normal when we see our neighbors. But, you know, look, the fact of the matter is, look at the statistics. The average American, over half of them, are, are a paycheck away from being broke. A $500 expense, according to bankrate.com, would put somebody out, 56% of Americans, they can't even afford a $500 expense, uh, unexpected expense. So, you know, look, don't try to mimic uh, the, the so-called illusion of the middle class. If you want to be rich, then you must mimic the wealthy. And the wealthy are not out buying things that are causing a, a, a mandatory monthly expense that is significantly high relative to their annual income. Uh, the wealthy are patient. The wealthy are not in a rush to get rich. You know, when you find yourself in that mindset that you're in a rush, that I need to buy this, I need to buy this stock that's going to go up 10 times. So that's right when you're about to lose money. The wealthy are not in that, they don't have that, um, that pressure on them. So try to mimic the rich. And uh, of course, read some books, listen to podcasts like this, and subscribe to futuremoneytrends.com, of course, and hear all my personal finance stories. Absolutely. Daniel, it's been a, a really a true, you know, a pleasure to have you. Um, like I said, I know that uh, not only you've done the newsletter, you've done a lot of other things to, uh, you know, uh, become a wealthy person. And I think that even these three main tips that you share 
Um, some people might hear it and it might come in through one ear and come out through the other one. Hopefully not, because I really think that when we do podcasts and videos, we want to bring as much value as possible. And it's um, information that people can really utilize and, and, and change their lives. It really, they can, but it starts somewhere, right? You can expect others to do it for you. It's a decision that you have to make. And I think those three points, like I said, that, that you mentioned, uh, you know, they, they truly uh, you know, very feasible for anyone to do. It doesn't matter where you're at and, and financially. So once again, Danny, it's been a true pleasure. Uh, I really want to thank you. And uh, hopefully I might have you in another episode discussing maybe about real estate because I can see you're a little bit knowledgeable about that. Is that right? Well, that's always fun. Yeah, I bought my first house at 18 years old. <laughs> that's incredible yeah it sounds like we need to have another episode about real estate investment <laughs> especially if you want to have passive much. income <laughs> right passive income Absolutely. hey daniel thank you so much i really appreciate it and uh folks until the next episode again this is liz soria and uh please like comment and share and again remember we are in soundcloud.com and you can find us on the tax advisory and business coach success podcast and also, if you're watching us, obviously, here on YouTube. Thank you so much. And, Daniel, once again, really appreciate it. And uh, and I wish you a lot of success. And I hope we stay in touch. And like I said, I'm, I'm getting your newsletter, so I'm going to be learning a lot from you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate all your time, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye.